All right, so let me go start. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Elena, and everybody here. Um, so the title of the talk here is "From Open to an Enterprise Data Catalog and Back." And when 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 Elena asked me to give this talk to, to come to participate in in, in this forum, um, I will be honest, I did not have a talk ready for it, but I had a lot of ideas about what this could be because this is something that I have been uh, this. It's an area that I've been exposed. Uh, to in the last year and a half since I joined uh, this company called Data.World, which I'll talk about in a second. So, um, let me just kick off some with the. Let me kick off with this. We have a lot of data everywhere, right? We don't have to go talk about this stuff. But what happens is that we don't always know what data we have, and the notion is that when we first want to be able to understand what data we have, and this is what I call let's go catalog the data. Let's literally go crawl all the information, all the, all the metadata. And uh, that's this first layer, what, I, what we call cataloging or crawling this data to understand what we have. And with that, you wanna be able to go under, make all these connections between, oh, I have all these data sets, I have all these tables, I have these columns, I have these business glossaries, I have these dashboards, I have, these, I have people, and this is, this is, uh, these are how everything starts getting interconnected. And this helps me to go find data. But once I find the data, I need to go do something with the data, right? I either go download it, but you really, the whole point is that you want to go do, act, you want to be able to access now the data. So in the first step, you're really interacting with the metadata. And in this next step, you're accessing the data. You're going to go query the data because you have questions you need to go answer. Now, in this process, what we've observed is that depending on the complexity of the data and enterprise data is can be very very complex we're talking about uh, databases that have thousands of tables and tens of thousands of columns right once you start realizing you're accessing this data you don't understand really what that data means and that's when you realize is like i need to be able to go put this layer of knowledge on top of all this inscrutable disparate data that i can have and this whole process is what i call the crawl walk and run which is we first need to start crawling, understanding what data we have, and let's go or get our metadata organized. And then we have, let's go start walking, which is let's go start accessing our data, querying our data. And eventually you will hit a wall and you will realize, wow, I don't understand, I truly don't understand this data. And, and we have so many people interpret the data differently. You start realizing we need to start adding knowledge to this data. Clean or dirty. So so we need to be able to do this crawl, walk, and run. And what I'm going to argue is that this notion of crawl, walk, and run is something that we'll be applying for both open data and enterprise data. So the takeaway here is that I believe that open and enterprise data catalogs are going to be uniting. And they have been advancing independently over, the, over time. And they need to unite in order to start answering those hard questions in a more efficient manner. So the big question here, and this is what I'm going to go through in this talk, is how can we actually get the open and open data catalogs and enterprise data catalogs working together? And the answers are these in these three topics: the data marketplace, uh, there's technical phenomena that we need to look at, and there's social phenomena. So this is what my talk is going to be, and 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 hopefully you'll stick around for the whole thing. So First of all, a little bit about me and where I'm coming from here. Um, I, I carry two hats. I carry my academic hat. Um, I, I, I did my PhD in computer science at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I, my research is all, is all things about data integration and understanding the relationship between relational databases and semantic web graph databases and all now what's called the knowledge graphs. And, and one of the things that came out of my PhD was a way to go virtualize relational databases as knowledge graphs, basically. Uh, and this is something that we went off and commercialized, which means I carry my other hat, uh, my industry business hat. Uh, I'm currently the principal scientist at data.world, and I joined data.world uh, over a year and a half, almost a year and a half ago uh, when they acquired my company, Capcenta, which is a company I started out on my PhD. Uh, and we've started to develop a lot of knowledge graph tools to be able to go do data integration. And over the over the years, I've I really like to take this kind of place between academia and industry and trying to be figure out how to be a bridge and translate academia to industry and try to identify the interesting problems in industry and bring it back to academia. So 
who is data.world? I think I, I, I'm bringing this up not for any salesy purposes, but to kind of give you context about where my interest in this area is. Uh, data.world, we're in a cloud native enterprise data catalog uh, with a, real, real, a lot of really cool data virtualization federation technology, and we're all built on knowledge graphs on semantic technologies. Uh, we are also the, the home to the world's largest open data catalog. We have around half a million data sets and over a million users. And data.world is a public benefit corporation, which means that in addition to maximizing shareholder value, we actually have a public benefit mission. And their mission comes in three parts, as you see below. We want to be, we want to build the most meaningful, collaborative, and abundant data resource in the world. We want to advocate for the proliferation of open data and linked data standards. We want to serve as an accessible historical repository for the world's data. So it is in our ethos, it is in our DNA to be able to work with open data and also work with enterprise data. And that's for me, before I joined Data World, I was all about the enterprise data. And here's where I started understanding more about open data and how it can be integrated together. So let's look about, let's, let's take this whole crawl, walk, and, and run approach that I'm presenting. And how does this look for open data catalogs or open data portals? Frankly, the focus on these data portals is really just on the metadata side. So you are cataloging data, you are cataloging the, all the metadata, right? You're getting information about what is this data set, and you may have information about the license, and then you're able to go a little bit into the access layer, into that data layer, because you all you do is that you go download the data set. But we don't have, we don't have ways to go start access, access these open data portals to go in and start taking one data set and another data set and start kind of combining them and integrating them and starting asking all these questions very quickly. It's something that usually people start downloading the files and then they have to do this uh, personally on, on their personal computers and so forth. So I think the focus what we, we see over time is that open, these open data catalogs, these open data portals are more focused on managing the metadata. And then the rest of the data and the knowledge is kind of left for later. Now, if we look at the enterprise data catalog, this is where we've seen so many advances and so many uh, 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 tools that have come out. So for example, on the metadata layer, right? This is where we start thinking about all the data governance uh, types of, of workflows that you wanna go have. Uh, you wanna be able to define your business glossaries and you wanna be able to connect your business glossaries with all your different uh, uh, data assets, assets that you are cataloging. Right? So we're in, in an enterprise, you're, you're extending not just to having tags, but you really want to be able to create your business glossary. Now, once you find your data, right, the typical thing in an enterprise or in an organization is that you're searching for data, you have ways to go search it, you found data, and you may want to request access for it because you may not have authorization. And then maybe you, you'll have you go through your governance structure and you'll, you'll have to you have to say why you want this data for how long do you want to have this data and so forth. For some tools, the story ends right there. But I think the evolution that we're starting to go see is that you go from metadata and the same data catalogs are starting to go into this world of data management, which says, oh, you want to go access the data? All right, you can do that within our data catalog too. You can go access it in a virtualized way, meaning that I'm not expected that the data, my original source of data is actually being pushed to the data catalog. It, con it continues to be on-prem, uh, in, in your control, and we're doing data virtualization. Now, you also want to be able to go have federation technology, right? Th you want to be able to say, here are different data sets that, I, that, that are in different databases. I want to be able to go combine and very quickly integrate this data as in a federated manner, have one query that can go federate. This is, these are the technologies that are enable us to have quick access to data. And then from there, I think a lot of the work that, that comes from uh, the, the semantic web community, all the, all, the, all the work in knowledge graphs is when you start saying, wait, I want to start defining these ontologies, well-defined vocabularies and then taxonomies that are connected. And I wanna be able to provide that, that, that the business view of the world and connect that and map that to that inscrutable, complicated databases. And these ontologies is what is starts to get related with the business glossaries that were defined early on. So this is the evolution that we're starting to go see in enterprise data catalogs. 
And what's really interesting here is that these enterprise data catalogs, because it's all about different types of connections, we're seeing them being built based on graphs, on knowledge graphs or any type of graph databases. So there's definitely a lot of commercial offerings. Data.world is a data catalog offering, but there's also a lot of things, companies who've been building their own. So a couple examples, I mean, several examples. So Twitter is, I think, kind of started this trend in 2016 about how do I discover data, right? The pain here is how do I discover data? Twitter comes out with their first approach to go do this. This is then followed by Airbnb with, with uh, 2017. Netflix releases in 2018 Metacat. This is actually an open source uh, uh, tool for data discovery, right? So you're seeing all these terms, right? I'm talking about data portals, data catalogs, data discovery tools. They're all basically mean the same type of thing. Um, Uber announces in 2018 Databook. Then you have uh, WeWork. WeWork has their own tool called Marquez, December 2018. Uh, Lyft is one that's gaining a lot of popularity because they've open sourced this, and this was built on top of, of uh, on graphs, on I think specifically on Neo4j, I think, on Munson. Um, then you have uh, LinkedIn releasing Data Hub. And then very recently, you start seeing Shopify releasing their own data discovery tool. So what we're observing here within the enterprise is that big Big companies have this pain of finding their data. And it all goes back to, yes, the 80-20 rule, I can't find my data and all that stuff. This is a particular pain that enterprise have. This is the same type of pain that we have on, 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 on this is what motivates to get a lot of the open data out there. That's why we have these data, data portals like CCAN and so forth. So independently, they're all kind of, a, they're heading towards that same direction. And that's the whole point that I wanna make here is that Open data catalogs, enterprise data catalogs, they're working independently. And their, and their goal is the same. I want to go help find data. There's questions I need to go answer. We want to go have transparency within our organizations. But we ask ourselves, what does it mean if we want to start uniting these two things, the open data catalog and the enterprise data catalog? And I think this is this notion of a data marketplace. So when you, the moment that we start connecting these two things, we start entering this, what we're calling this data marketplace. So what is a, a data marketplace? And, 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 and this is, this is my, our biased kind of definition. I'll be very frank about this. So a data marketplace is really, we're, we're describing this experience of, to help find data within the organization, within a company, but you also wanna go find and source data from outside the organization. So it ends up being almost a two-way, well, it can be considered a two-way street. You have data internally, and then you have data externally. And, that, and the external data is not just open data. It's also third-party vendor data. So there can be other organizations who they have data and they want to be able to expose it and probably sell it to, to other organizations. So you have this cycle within this, uh, in a data market. And ultimately, the problem is the same, regardless if it's internal data or external data, is that you want people, you want to connect people to the data, to the right data to go answer the same, to, to answer their questions. Now, one of the things that is key is that you, the users, not, we know they want to have trust and context, but you really want to have a low barrier to get your data, get your hands on the data. I'm going to talk about some of the examples I've been, I've, I've, I've been learning in, in different industries. So essentially, a data marketplace is this functional catalog where you're cataloging your internal data and, event, and also your external data. And that external data can be open data, third-party vendor data. That's how we're seeing what is a data marketplace. So let me go through an example. So let's say, so in, in the last couple of months, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been doing a lot of research in, in the area of, of, of insurance, of, of, of PNC commercial insurance. And I've been trying to understand how this industry is using external data, let it be open data or third party data, and the processes that they go through. So, first of all, when you only have your own internal data, right? So, this is your, your typical complex enterprise data. And this is, let's assume this is an insurance company and, and they're trying to go. Um, just do all types of analysis over claims. And, and you have all these standard KPIs that you wanna be able to go do, right? You, you wanna understand what is your loss ratio? 
for example. You say how much money people are paying in, how much money is going out to go pay for, for claims, and that and what's left over is 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 that is what we consider the loss ratio. I want to know my claim severity, like how severe are all the claims that I'm paying out. So these are just your typical types of of, of KPIs that you should be able to go do just with your internal data. But let's say that we want to be able to go do a specific type of analysis, and we're looking at claims that are that are related to fire. So there's been a fire catastrophe uh, at at locations that I that I insure, and I want to be able to understand what's going on. So the loss ratio, higher numbers of a loss ratio is bad, lower, lower numbers are better. So if we look at this graph and we see, well, in a particular period of time, I see that things, I don't see in this particular graph, I don't see big trends or anything, right? I, it, it's hard for me to take something away from this. So I can still do some analysis internally, but I, I want more context out of this. So now let's think about it. You have an analyst who says, well, let's go correlate the data our, of our, the claims of these, over these locations with the location of, um, of uh, fire stations. So I have my internal data and in the US, you can go to the US Fire Administration website or to the FEMA and you can go and download the data set of every single fire station in the United States. So when you download that, actually you download a, a CSV file. Actually, the extension is actually a text, a TXT. So what usually happens here? Within typical organizations, somebody is manually going off to the web, downloading this CSV file, and if the person is technically savvy enough, they can probably do something on their laptop. Maybe they, maybe they have access to a database where they can load data. Uh, maybe that database is, 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 is kind of near or, or to where that current internal database is so they can actually do some joins over the data. Uh, maybe they will download, uh, take a, 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 a dump of their internal data as a spreadsheet, and then they do things in Excel. Uh, maybe they will put things together in, 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 in an access database. Maybe they're not technical savvy enough, and they're going to have to go and set up, call an I, the IT folks and set up an IT project to go bring in this uh, external data, and that They'll probably have a huge backlog, so it's going to take a while to go do this. And by the way, you don't even know that this data is actually valuable. This is just a hunch, right? So you start doing all this stuff, and you and, and, and to the point that it's going to take a lot of time. Let's go now. Now, also, you look about it. Let's think that this data has zip codes, but my internal data has Latin longs. So maybe I need to go find another data set that has the zip codes with Latin longs and we can find them in different places. At the end, when I start putting all this data together, you can get some interesting insights. So for example, here following this, continuing this example, you, you realize, wow, the claims that have lowest loss ratio are the ones that have a fire station nearby. And the claims that have a lo high loss ratio, the fire stations are, are far away. Hey, that may we, we probably have an issue with our risk. We're probably insuring uh, too many places we need to, we, that have that have that are tendency with fires, and there's not a fire station nearby, right? This is a typical example that you get. The insights when you start combining internal and external data. This is open data, but now let's look at another example. We have third-party data. So. Another thing that we are, that we are observing a lot is that organizations realize we need to get external, we need to find extra data. Let it be open data that we can go find freely on the web, but maybe there's other type of data out there that I just don't know who has it. So I want to go. I want. I would love to go ask somebody. Go find me this data and tell me and see if it exists. See who has it, and and then you start a negotiation. You start realizing, wait, okay, this is a vendor. They're going to go sell me their data. Um, and they and and they may. How do I know that this data is valuable? Maybe they'll just send me a, a handful of rows, for example. So here, this is a very typical scenario that we see: is that when these third-party vendors come in, they say, "Here is a handful of rows that you can go test and see see the the type of data that we have." But maybe the data that they give you matches very nicely. 
but you don't know if that's going to correlate for the entire data set. And they're obviously not going to send you all their data because then you already have it. You're going to send you the data once you pay for it. Now, what usually happens is that they say, no, you send me your data and I'll give you the matches for it. But then if for to do that, you need to go, your, your organization needs to go through all the legal aspects to get the data out of your organization being sent to this third party vendor to go through the matches. So that's another big hurdle that happens. So ultimately what occurs is that people just go send a handful of data, let it be a hundred rows, a thousand rows. They do the matches and they say, okay, I think this looks good. I'm, uh, I'm gonna go buy and pay for your data. And then once they get the rest of the data set, they say, wow, this was bad. And, and, and you, typical reasons are, wait, I'm looking, for example, when it comes to location, I'm looking for data that is, uh, I, 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 in the insurance space, uh, I, we insure more rural places. And I just bought data that is very good in urban places and not rural. So then I say, wow, that vendor is bad data. Well, it's not really bad data. It's that we did not know that I'm more rural and they're more urban or vice versa. Right? These are the big issues that we start seeing when these internal and external sources are not talking uh, together. So, 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 but let's say we start integrating this data. We realize uh, in this, this uh, third-party vendor data, in this example, is detailed information about houses. In this car, it's, let's say, houses in Austin. And this information, this data will have the year the house was built, will tell me if the house has a fireplace or not. That's going to be very valuable information. If what, and I, once I, I, and then once I get the data, we go through the same type of integration aspects, right? Well, eventually, once we get, when we're able to go integrate the data, you say, if I, if I look at this, I'm saying, wow, orange means that there is a fireplace. The loss ratio is at the bottom right. Higher loss ratio is worse. And here we have houses that are older on the bottom. And you can see that the bottom right, it's a lot of orange, which means that we have a lot of claims for houses that are old and have fireplaces and have lot high loss ratio. This is an issue. And if we go back to that previous graph that kind of didn't make a, make a lot of sense, we realized, wow, a lot of the, a lot of the claims that we have are uh, fire related claims are the ones that have fireplaces. So now imagine as you, as you can, as you can consider the next evolution is a third analyst comes in and says, wait, somebody did this work already on integrating the open data from FEMA and the fireplaces. Somebody did this work with this third party vendor data. I want to go put all this work together because, hey, that can make some that can that can bring us a lot of more great information, more insights. So you start wanting to go integrate all this data and then you eventually start getting even more better insights. Right. You realize, well, actually, the house, the, the locations that we ensure that have lowest loss ratio and have a fire station that nearby are actually the youngest houses. And the ones that we have the highest loss ratio and have the furthest fire stations away, they're actually the oldest houses. This will help me a lot to understand how to go reassess my business. So I, I guess it's, it, it, it shouldn't be here at this aha moment that combining internal and external data is valuable, right? But I think that it's not, we're not the two communities, I mean, call it the, the, the enterprise data community and the open data community and the third part are not really thinking about how they should be working together to facilitate the, and eliminate all of this friction that we're seeing. The amount of time and the amount of money that is wasted to kind of put this data together is tremendous. So how do we get there? So first of all, let me go talk a little about what I'm calling this techni the technical phenomenon aspects. So yes, as you can imagine, there's all these challenges for data integration that we need to go address, right? And these are typical challenges that we've been addressing for over two decades and more, right? Schema matching continues to be a big problem. Entity resolution is a very huge problem, right? Understanding how one thing, a, a location, these two different locations are, are the same, these two different people are the same. This, yes, this continues to be a huge challenge. Um, I, I think challenges that we've been addressing very well is being able to go do virtualization and federation. I think that's something that we've now, I think it's almost now a commodity that we can take. Data quality is something that we always want to be able to understand and how we can better automate, how we can better flag and understand the quality of your data. The same thing as data lineage. I want to understand where my data comes from. 
and data dot 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 there's so many different aspects and, and, and features around data integration that we need to go uh, deal with so not surprising how do we get this better is that we still need to go work on data integration but a couple of things i want to go show you is i think things that we have for table stakes now and this is the point that i want to make is if we're going to go spend our energy there are things that i think that we've kind of as from the academic point of view we've already been able to translate this back into into uh to, to industry to practice now so for example data virtualization and federations are now table stakes these are so so many different companies and tools that do this right now uh this is a, this is again a screenshot within data.world of how we have virtualization we do all all these things are in sparkle we do sparkle federation and, and virtualization these are things that we can do very quickly nowadays and i think this is really helping us advance in this so the point here is we want to be able to have these types of techniques, these tools that helps us integrate data very quickly. Quality is always will, be, will always be an issue, and I think quality is also in the in the eye of the beholder, as, you, as I'll talk later about when we talk about users. So you want to be able to have very quickly under when I upload data, have a quick scan of the data and tell me what tell me how this data is looking like. I want to be able to go query the data to be able to get get, get quick insights about it. You want to have here's the other thing is that people who are creating data portals data catalogs it doesn't mean that you need to go support all these quality uh, uh features i think what is important is that you have the ability to plug and play with other types of quality tools i think that's what's really key here that you don't want to go boil the ocean and, and create systems that are going to go do everything you want to be able to understand how to partner best with different types of of, of, of tools for data quality when it comes for, when we start actually building a data portal, data catalog, we talk a lot about search recommendations. And I wanna talk about suppliers. Um, let me go first about search. I think search is something that we're starting to see actively a lot more research. Uh, and, and there's a lot, I've been finding a lot of interesting papers recently. Uh, I know, Elena, I think you, you, you're part of a, a really nice survey, right, about, about data set search. This is something that still is, an, there's a huge opportunity to go improve. Search has been usually focused on unstructured data. And we really need to go extend the search to more structured type of data. And I think that we really need to go consider more different types of indexing techniques and stuff like that. We are doing this, I think there's a lot more to improve, uh, but this is a very important aspect to be able to go, so for users to start using and finding the data catalog. And, it, and we need to go extend more than just your typical elastic search. So I think table stakes is people doing search based on the metadata. We need to be able to understand how to do search more with inside, inside, uh, inside of your data. I think that's something I'm, we're seeing a lot of active work in there. And I'll talk about a lot of some of the research aspects that, 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 that within data world that our, and our research partners we're doing. So search is, is a really important aspect we need to go focus on. Recommendations, as you can imagine too. So I wanna be able to go find a data set and I, or, or once I find a data set, I wanna be able to see other data sets that are recommended, that are related. And I also want to be explained why those data sets can be, uh, are, are related. You also wanna go leverage your social graph within here. So I think with the, when you think about data catalogs, it's not, you're not just cataloging the metadata and the data. You also wanna go catalog the people. You also wanna understand who are the people within your social network, within your organization, that may be doing things similar to you because you wanna go leverage the work that other people have done too. So I think that's another aspect that we're not looking into. And when it, so the, the recommendation aspect is something that we really need to go improve more. And I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Now, when you, when you start, when we start seeing, uh, so one thing is that you have your data sets kind of as, is what's being shown within your, your, your data portal, your data catalog. But then you also have the suppliers. So you could have a supplier and the supplier has multiple data sets. So you don't, own, so you don't just want to go promote what is each data set. You also want to go promote the supplier of that data. So for example, the Associated Press 
is a, a customer and a user of data world. And when you go to the social press, you can not just go find the data about uh, just different data sets. You also want to go find the supplier, in this case, the Associated Press, because the suppliers themselves will have all this so the kind of the social leverage, right? People start uh, trusting more of these suppliers and they're going to start looking and, and, and these things can even help you on the ranking on the search. So ability to go follow an organization that you trust, that you want, that you want to be notified if they have new data sets and stuff like that. This helps us. It's a different way of finding, uh, finding, finding data. So on the social side, there's a social phenomenon here that I want to do. By the way, up to now, these technical phenomena, this, this shouldn't be a surprise. I'm kind of, everything that I've been presenting here is kind of, there's nothing new, there's nothing wow, aha here. And that's on purpose because I think we are already kind of targeting that and there's still work to be done. But the one thing that I really want to go push is the social phenomenon aspect of things. First of all, I think that we have, we have really lost the definition, or we've lost how we want to go define success. We think about data as kind of the end goal. So you think about, I'm, here's your data. I'm, I, I, I put my data in a portal. Success, we're done. I've integrated my data in a data lake. Success, we're done. No, that's not true. Success is when the person who needs to go answer a question is able to go answer that question. And they find the data in the data lake. They find the data in a data portal, data catalog. So putting the data together and making it searchable, that's a means to an end. And I think we have been focusing our success criteria from this technical perspective of, yes, I'm able to go integrate my data. I'm able to go find my data. But we forget about the users. So if we think about within organizations, you, hold, you, you, you there's these two kind of parties. You have your data producers, who are the folks who understand the data, how the data was collected, they understand how the data is interconnected, they understand how to go merge the data. These are usually what we call data engineers or probably even data stewards. Then you have your consumers of data, right? These are your data analysts, these are your data scientists, these are the business users, right? They're the ones who need to understand, who understand the business and need to go and understand the questions that need to go get answered. So how do the how do do how do these two data producers and consumers talk to each other? It's really not well defined. And there is this big gap. And what I'm arguing is that we need to fill this gap with what I'm calling this role of a data product manager. And within organizations, within governments and stuff, I believe that we need to think about understanding the data where it comes from and who is going to co-consume it and, and and making sure that we understand the, 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 the words and expectations and terminology that consumers have and making sure that we're actually deriving that data in a way that it fulfills those needs. I also believe that the data product manager, the data product management team is the folks who are responsible for the data. And I think this is something that we're not even thinking about. Who is responsible for your data? What happens if decisions are made on the data and the outcomes are negative? Who's responsible for that? Or the contrary, what if the, the outcomes were so incredibly positive? Who's, who, who takes credit and who celebrates that? So a lot of the work that we also see that, that doesn't get done with, that doesn't get uh, appreciated is what we call the 80-20 the, the, the rule. Right, and I think this is where we need to have this evolution from a from the work that the data scientist does into more of this knowledge scientist. So I, I think the folks who will work in this middle uh, in this middle area, the, the data product manager, are folks who know how to think with both sides of their brains, and they know how they understand how the the business or the consumers of data think about the world, and they know how to go deal with the access the actually the raw data and go access that data. Um, they're people persons with the consumers and they're more geeks with the kind of IT folks. So this whole notion I'm presenting of the knowledge scientists, I, th this is one of these roles that I, I see that we're, we, we will be reviving coming back from the 90s of this knowledge engineering. So we always hear about this 80-20 rule, right? The, 80, the data scientists spend 80% of their time cleaning the data and all that stuff and only 20% of their time doing the analysis. Right? So you imagine data scientist is the person who's going off and, and, and looking for data and you're 
in your data portal and your data catalog, well, they're going to go download this data and the data is not going to be the best. So I believe that this knowledge scientist is the person who needs to be takes the responsibility and focuses on that 80%. And this 80% isn't about cleaning the data. Oh, there's extra spaces or parentheses or all that stuff. No, it's really understanding the meaning. So remember that crawl, walk, and run? That run when we start adding knowledge? Your data is going to get much more understood and, and valued once you have data that has knowledge attached to it. And that knowledge work is not data janitorial work. That knowledge work is actually fundamental understanding of what this data is actually supposed to mean. And, and I actually on purpose call it a knowledge scientist because there's hypotheses here. Like we, the consumers of data will expect the, the data to mean different things. Let's go figure out what is true out there. Let's go see where this data is and which is the right definition. here. So how do you know what is a knowledge scientist? And, and, and if you're gonna say yes to multiple of these things, I think you're a knowledge scientist and not a data scientist. Are you the person who, within the organization, you're the one who's trying to understand the true pain points uh, of, of the stakeholders within your organization? Do you debate with the stakeholders the definition of different terms? What is a customer, right? Uh, what is an order? Uh, what is a claim? Do you do, Are you the person who tries to understand what people are saying and you draw on the whiteboard sketches of models and draw your bubbles and lines, right? Do people come to you asking for data instead of going to their data portal, to, the, to their data catalog, right? Do you find yourself in the middle of conversations between these producers and consumers? Are you the person maintaining the data catalog, right? Are you the person who's running the, 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 your, your, the data portal catalog within your organization and you know how all these things are connected and when people come to you, you tell them, oh, you should really look at this thing and not this other thing and so forth, right? Are you the, are you the person who's negotiating with the owners of data? People want to have their data into your catalog. Are you that person? Do you actually wrangle and clean data, et cetera, et cetera, right? Do you feel responsible for your team's data? If you're saying yes to many of these things, I believe that you are not, and, you, and your title is a data scientist, I believe you are a knowledge scientist. Uh, for furthermore, kind of insights and reading, the way we're thinking about this, I've been collaborating with uh, Professor George Fletcher from Eindhoven and Professor Paul Groth from Amsterdam on this notion of a knowledge scientist. And I'll, and I'd highly encourage you to go to knowledgescientist.org uh, to take a look at this paper that we've written and join our community here. So on the social aspect, I think we need to go make sure we have the right people to go manage the data. And it's this whole knowledge science part of these data product management teams. Another second, a second social aspect is we all talk that data is the new oil and all that stuff, right? But we truly don't treat data as a first-class citizen. Now, what I'm showing you here is, is kind of the, the table stakes uh, 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 approach methodology that we do that we follow for software. And I ask myself, why don't why don't we treat data like we treat software? I'm not saying we should, I'm just I'm asking myself. So if you look at if we think about software. I mean, frankly, as, as mankind now, we know how to go do software. We know how to set up a team. We know how to, we know who to hire. We know what tools we need to have, right? I need to go hire software engineers. I need to go hire uh, people who do QA and testing. I need to hire a product manager. Product manager is a person who gets the requirements from the users, who translates those requirements to the engineers, right? We follow agile methodologies. 20 years ago, we followed waterfall methodologies. Now we follow agile methodologies, right? We have uh, scrum masters. We follow Kanbans, right? We go, uh, um, we have tools like GitHub, Jira to go manage our issues. We, uh, uh, we have continuous integration and continuous development with all our test cases. Why don't we treat data that way? Why do we put, why do we just dump data on, on, on a data portal, on an open data portal, or within our own data uh, catalog, as is. And we expect other people to go do the work. Why do we treat data that way? I think this is a fundamental thing that we need to rethink. And part of this is how do we adapt methodologies? How, how do we create methodologies or adapt existing methodologies to data? 
what does it mean to be a data team? I argue that you need to have your producers, you, consumers, you need to have this data product manager. You have this people who do the, the knowledge science, you need to be able to people who come up with testing, make sure that the da new coming data continues to be validated and so forth. This is something that I think it's really, it, it worries me that we're not treating data as a first class citizen when we all claim that data is the new oil, that we want our governments to release data and data needs to be go used for transparency, but we're not treating it with the respect that it should have. We really need to open our eyes and go do something here and treat data as first-class citizens. Now, another thing that I believe that, well, kind of a prediction that I have is a way that we can help us focus instead of boiling the ocean is to really focus on particular industries. And when we start releasing data, we want and either, again, open data or, 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 or internal company data, is how can we make sure that we can make this data reusable? And this goes back to kind of all the, the, the I mean, the early, the semantic web to being having to have reusable ontologies and goes back to early in the nineties too, where we were talking about when ontology started to become a more popular thing. I think what happened a lot during the nineties and in, in, in 2000s, we started getting into these really complicated conceptual models. Right. Every single industry has these very complicated conceptual models. Right. The insurance industry has a cord. Lately, the finance industry created FIBO. But when you start looking at these things, they're pretty abstract. One. Second, they end up basically being on a piece of paper or a PDF and just a, a UML picture with a business glossary, and that's it. It gets completely disconnected, and it, it ends up being so abstract. I believe that we need to. The same way we have um, a, a catalog of data, we want to be able to have these catalog of data models on them, but not just the data model by itself. You want to have your analytics, your your the the the, the, the standard KPIs that different industries will have. Every, for example, every retail e-commerce company, they all ask the same type of questions, right? How much product should I have in the warehouse because uh, too much is bad and too little is bad too, right? Everybody asks that, right? Every single insurance company will be asking, well, what is my loss ratio? What's my claim severity and so forth? So these things we can almost, these are answers, these are questions that everybody has. Let's make sure that we can have predefined models of data with the predefined queries and questions that people are trying to go ask and make this reusable. And then when you start thinking about the data, so you need to be able to answer those questions, you need to bring in your internal data, but there's also out there's this, this extra, ex, this external open data, and let's start making sure that this external data is getting connected to these industry specific data models. And yes, the industry specific data models will overlap, but so we start, so let's not just push these things out individually. Let's get the industry data models or ontologies, whatever you want to call them, connected together with the questions that you want to go answer with them connected together with the open data that can be useful for it. So you want, to, you want your open data to be valuable. You say, well, here's my open data connected with this existing model in your industry. These questions are already there, ready for you to be executed. All you need to go do is plug in your internal data. This is how we can really facilitate answering these questions faster and making valuable use of our external open data. This is a prediction that I have. Another thing that I think will happen from a social perspective is we're starting to go see an opportunity, and frankly, maybe even an industry on data concierge services or, or a term or a role called data hunters. Remember, I gave during my example that we, an, this insurance company, for example, they're looking for detailed data about houses in Austin. Who do they ask? Right now, what do they do? They literally will just go search on Google. Austin house data, right? And they'll find the, the popular ones, right? In the US, you have Zillow and Realtor and stuff like that. But there may be other people who have that stuff. So how, how, are, you, how are these things being connected? How are the, the basically the, the, the producers and the consumers of the data themselves, right? How are they getting connected? It, it, it's fascinating a lot that you see that right now people go off and they, when they, when they get connected to a vendor, pretty pathetic. They still have to go down, they go to an, FF, an FTP site, SFTP hopefully, 
they'll download a, a CSV file and they keep that, and then they manually have to go do that process. And when the data gets updated, somebody manually has to go in and download that file again. Right? This is the current process that people do today. Um, I think there's going to be an opportunity, even a, a business opportunity, uh, an expansion in the industry on having these data concierge services where you can actually, just like when you go to a hotel, you have a concierge service that recommends you places to go. I want to have a data concierge service that tells me, how do I help me find your data? And connecting to what I, to the previous point I was making, your data concierges will be industry specific too. And they will very, they will know very well the industry and the types of data that you're needing to answer these questions. And you're going to have these roles of data hunters. So I have several kind of call to arms here to start wrapping up. First of all, we need to, we frankly sometimes don't even define what success is, right? So you're releasing data. Why? What, what does success look like? How are you measuring success? What are your metrics for doing it? You want to go catalog all your data. Why? What, 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 are, what are you going to gain out of cataloging all your data? Let's, let's connect it to value. And, and that's also the way of how we avoid boiling the ocean and saying, let's go catalog all the data here. Let's go start, start small and, 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 and avoid boiling the ocean and then start incrementing, right? Here's the other thing is, who is, who is this success for? And this is something that we're seeing a lot within organizations is that you, 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 you may not be even reporting to the current organization structure that you have within, within the place that you work with. So, for example, you may think that you need to go or, or you may want to go be innovative and bring in all this extra data to go do really great stuff. But maybe you report to the chief financial officer whose focus is to cut, cut costs. So your 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 success criteria are completely different. So as as simple as it sounds, it's it's honestly it's pretty sad that when I go talk to people, they don't even know what success it means and they don't have a way of measuring it. So define success and how are you going to measure it? Second, get your data in order. I postulate, I predict that the next generation of the workforce is coming out. Millennials are coming out to work. Millennials will want to go off and work at places that have clean, beautiful data. You have two companies. One who has really complicated data that you still need to go download it from an SFTP site and do all this stuff in Excel. Or you have another company who has great systems, the data is really clean, you know, the data is self-explanatory, they have great tools to go hit the ground running. As a, as a young, as a young uh, professional now in the workforce, where do you want to go work? How are you going to go hire their best talent? I think hiring the best talent, which is the future of your organization, is depending on how ordered is your data. So get your data in order. I believe this notion of a data product manager is going to be the next thing. I, 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 the same thing the knowledge scientist, sorry, the data scientist was the sexy uh, job. I think in a couple years, not this is what I'm betting on, is that the knowledge scientist will be the next sexy thing. And you'll have this data product management. You'll have these teams, right? They're part that are, we're treating the data as a first class citizen. Ask yourself within your organization, who is responsible for your data? Who does this knowledge work? How is that being documented? And I also ask myself, and the, and, and the reason why my, my prediction here would not, will not be true is that we're not going to be training the next generation of data workers correctly. And frankly, Right now, people get a master's in data science in a year, and they learn big data, Hadoop stuff, and then they learn R and all these things. What happened in the middle, right? They learn to be producers, they learn to be consumers, but what happened in the middle? They don't, I mean, frankly, people aren't even learning how to go, how to do any data modeling. And we talk about what does this data actually mean? And nobody's learning logic or knowledge representation. These, these seem to be kind of almost like lost arts. So I think the call to arms here for the academics, for the educators, is to make sure that we are training people correctly to understand the value of data. Here's an interesting prediction, and this is actually, I will take it from Gartner. Gartner recently took this out, is we need to go change this mantra from don't share data to must share data unless. 
So organizations that promote data sharing will outperform their peers on most of their business value metrics. So this will start internally, obviously. So within organizations, people don't even share their data internally. So we need to go turn into this transparency. I think this is where organizations can learn a lot from the open data. Like, let's be transparent about our data. We need to have this culture of transparency. It's, it's, it's fine if we don't agree. Let's actually promote being, being transparent and, and let's promote the friction that we have if we don't agree. You know where the skeletons are in the closet? That, let, make that public so that people can know about it. The thing is that there's just so much, so many wheels being reinvented. How many people within an organization are doing something with the data and somebody else is doing something very similar, the same, and they basically spent the time doing the same thing and maybe their overlap is a lot and that and the difference that they don't overlap is, is it can be very significant. And that can make us under have different answers for the same question. I think later on, we're gonna start seeing that we want to go share our, our internal data. We want to go, go share it too. And I think that there is this opportunity to have what I'm, what I'm calling here data, data for social good. There's just so much data that people go off and buy and, and people spend money on data and they realize it is, wow, I just bought data from somebody and I didn't, they didn't do anything else. They just downloaded it from the free open, open web or open data portals. They probably did some very small things and I just paid a lot of money for that. So there's people who are really taking advantage of this, which I find that inappropriate. And I think that there's this opportunity to really, let's make sure that if we keep these practices and we have data, we think about data as a first class citizen, we're actually gonna have data for social good. Finally, we really need to understand our users, which is something that we, that, that again, we, we don't, def Define success is you also need to know who's for the user, right? Who are the users? You're creating this data for what type of users in what industry? Because it, 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 can, it can change, the, ex the expectations can change. And the success really depends on the user's expectation. So a couple of examples of what we're doing in, in, um, at data.world, I, I, I have the huge fortune that I can, as I, as I mentioned, I carry my two hats, my, my, my academic hat and my industry business hat, and I can bridge the gap between academia and industry. So we have all these different research partners. One of them is with Lehigh University, where we're doing a lot of, uh, we're, we're studying data set search. So we're partnering with computer science with uh, Professor Jeff Heflin and, and, and Brian Davidson, and also with folks from the journalism department. And, and, and we actually have a, a survey go, that has gone out where we, can, where we want to understand how data journalists are searching for data. And so we talk about data set search, right? Everybody, a lot of people are working on data set search, but let's actually focus on a particular vertical industry. In this, in this aspect, we're looking at data journalists. And we really want to understand how data journalists are searching for data. And I think this, is, this, this whole notion of understanding your user is critical because maybe the way how data, set, how data journalists are searching for data is different from a way a, a biologist is gonna be searching for data. So I don't think we can have claims. So if we're gonna create data catalogs or data portals that have search, do we really think that it's one general search for everybody? I don't know. At least I think it's important to understand our users. Another example that we have is uh, with the University of Edinburgh uh, with uh, Professor Leonid Lipkin, and we're trying to understand how users actually deal with null values. And this is really interesting because there's null values in all empty values all over the data. You download data sets and everything. How do, how do users actually interpret the null values? What do they do when they see null values? We don't really know. And this can really change how we can recommend data. When people upload data to a, to a data portal, to a data catalog, we can tell them about the issues they may have with nulls and why they should care about it or how to prioritize data quality aspects that have nulls. Let's really understand how people are using nulls. This is an example. So to kind of wrap up, I do want to, the, the, everything I presented here is built on this vision that data.world has, and I joined data.world. I'm very passionate about the vision that we have. Data World started out around 2015 to go create the world's largest open data community. And we have half a million data sets, over a million users. And what we did is that we really 
focus to create like the GitHub of data to really understand the users and understand and make sure that we can create a platform that's web scale. And then from there we say, let's go apply this technology that we have developed for the enterprise. And that's why we're in this enterprise data catalog. But our nat natural evolution where we're heading is this whole data marketplace, is that we wanna be able to go connect our enterprise data that's being cataloged with the open data that has also been cataloged. And this is our vision. And I, I have to say, if you're excited about it, please let me know because we're hiring it actively. Final kind of a note here, uh, every Wednesday at four o'clock central, I, uh, we host a, a live podcast recording we call Cataloging Cocktails. And actually tomorrow is, is perfect timing is because we're gonna be talking about data marketplaces. Uh, we're gonna be joined by our friend, Jeremy Basket from Essential. Uh, he's also been part of Bloomberg and has been on both sides of acquiring data and, and also on, on selling data on, on both sides, understanding the issues about data marketplace of getting open data and, 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 inter, and, and internal data together. So please uh, join us. So I started almost, I guess, 50 minutes ago on this question, how can open and enterprise data catalogs work together? And my thesis is that they have been have advanced independently and they really need to unite to answer these hard questions together. We're going to have this data marketplace. We need to find a, we have ways to find data within your organization and also outside your organization. And you, the whole goal is to just connect people with the data that they need. And you need to have a way where the barrier is very low to get hands on with the data. Second, yes, we have this technical phenomenon. We need to continue working on these hard data integration challenges. But I, I encourage people, the, these are extremely hard problems. Let's try to reduce the problem to something smaller, more manageable. And then a way of doing this is to understand the industry, uh, under, try to figure out to solve the problem for a particular industry. I believe every industry will be different and, and then you'll have a smaller problem to go address. And also make sure that you are understand who are the users. We have data set search and recommendation. These are things that need to be, uh, um, continue to be worked on and improved on and this notion of data suppliers and making sure their suppliers are actually available within the marketplace. And finally, this social phenomenon. I believe we'll have this data market, the, the data product manager, right? The bridge between the consumers and, and the producers. And you'll have this notion of the knowledge scientist who's really gonna be in charge of doing all that knowledge work. We need to have data assets as first class citizens. And we, I think we're gonna have this new industry notion of data concierge and data hunters. Don't forget, define what success means, get your data in order so you can hire the best people, depends on the future of your organization. Start, translate, tra start transition from a don't share data mentality to a must share data unless mentality and understand your users. And with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Juan. I mean, there's um, there's so many points in this uh, visionary talk that that uh, resonate very well with uh, some of the experiences of, of the work that we've been doing in the European um, uh, data portal and probably also um, with uh, some of the work um, and, um, and interests of some of the people in the audience. So I have lots of questions. Uh, we don't have so much time left for them, but perhaps a few, but I would want to um, just uh, perhaps give priority to, to some of the participants to either add questions to the chat or just raise their hands or, um, or um, unmute themselves and, and ask a question live. I'm seeing the chat here. Um, I, I, I'm actually happy to continue for 20 minutes. Yeah, so, so we probably have, um, 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 because of the, of the platform that we're using, we have a slightly earlier um, heart ending. Uh, but no, nevertheless, no. Um, I think um, there's been so much to, to think about and discuss in the presentation that, that I, I, I wouldn't want to, to stop now. And I see there is a question from Axel. Axel, thank you for joining us. Um, and the question is, how would you think that we can inv incentivize opening metadata, at least for companies? Yeah, so um, I'm actively going through this right now, um, specifically in, in, in the insurance space where I'm doing a lot of the research. I think is that you need to show 
you need to show value with the open data. So that's why I'm going through these examples of, of, of data related data and stuff like that. So if I go back to, 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 to this slide, I think that if you, 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 show, you, you show organizations saying, hey, here is the, here's particular, here's an industry standard metadata for a particular, for, again, this, again, this is an insurance, right? And I already have this external data connected to it. And I got these questions that can literally, by the click of a button, I could go answer your questions, except I can't answer it right now because I don't have your data. You're saying, I can plug this in. You can start asking so many different questions. And I'm going to give you just something to start off with. So basically, all, what I'm trying to go say is the way to incentivize is to make sure that you're being able to go so, and answer questions that they're trying, that companies are trying to go do, that they're struggling to go do today and because it just takes too much time. So if we're able to go show them value, right? This is the whole, how do we incentivize anybody to showing them value? So what is the value they want to go show them? And I believe it's, you can reduce the amount of time and you could, you reduce the amount of time one and you can in increase the insights that you can get by combining this stuff. Therefore, hey, if you're not going to go do it, one of your competitors is going to go do it and they're going to go beat you. All right, thank you for that. Um, so, so just perhaps for clarification, because of the context of the, the webinar series, which is the European data portal, which deals with um, open government data. So, so data sets that are released by, by public authorities at various levels. Um, so we index 80 or so catalogs and over a million data sets. But I was just wondering, um, just for clarification, so when you talk about open data and data.world, um, what what is your definition, if I may ask, so of open data? And do you, do you talk about openly available data or do you talk about data that is shared, but perhaps with a, with a network, could be quite a large network as well? So within data world, it's both. So actually we have either the US census or data.gov or, or, or they're all pushing their data within data.world. So, and then everybody can put the licenses that they want in there. So it, it is open data as whoever the produ who, whoever's producing data and uploads to the data.world, they can define their open data with their licenses. That's for sure. You can also privately put, push data if you want. Um, you decide what license to go put on it. You can make private accounts and you can go share it. Maybe I can, I think this is also what you wanna go do is, I can I I can go combine my data with your data, even though I don't know who you are, but you left your data open. I can go combine it because you left it that way. So I think we want to be able to have that mix and match yeah. and have the possibility. Yeah. That's, and that's and related you're... related to that, um, so because you were talking about the users, right? And 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 one of the the slight challenges for 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 doing this sort of user research is because. Um, there aren't perhaps so many successful examples of these sort of platforms online where you have different sorts of data with different types of licenses and, and, and you said a million users um, uh, coming together to, to use that. So, so, so do you have an understanding to some degree what, what the main user typologies are for, um, for people who use your, your, your platform? So, so why do they come to data.world rather than going to data.gov? Oh, well, so I, 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 I can't answer that question with, with facts and data supporting it, but I'll just give you kind of my anecdote in my, yeah. uh, so, sure. um, so within data world, I mean, I, I don't want this to make to make it a salesy thing about data world, but um, I'll take a little advantage of it. Um, I think when you go to these data data portals, all you're doing is just kind of basic basic metadata, right? What I was saying. Here's this data set. Here's the last time it was uploaded. You can download it in all these formats. And that's it. Go run with it. In data world, you can go. You can go query it, you can go create projects, you can go federate integrate things. We have these notions of, and we have projects where you can actually go do your analysis. We have so many integrations, you can go plug in R and Python and, 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 and all, all these types of stuff. So it's really, you really wanna, you really wanna have a platform where the user can do all their data work in one place. Otherwise it continues to be all fragmented one thing. Mm -hmm. Yes, the first step is to go to metadata, but again, you wanna, once, once somebody finds the data, the next thing is then you go do something with the data, which means 
I want to go look at it. I want to go query it. I want to go ask questions about it. Mm -hmm. In data world, all of that is in the same place. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Let me um, just perhaps pick some more questions from the from the chat. So uh, Luis is asking, among other things, um, you mentioned marketplaces as a natural evolution of data.world. Uh, which challenge would you consider more important um, or, or harder to solve uh, matchmaking, um, I assume, between publishers and, and, and consumers or pricing? That is a great question, which I do not know. I don't. I can't. I can't give you a good answer to it. I will highly recommend you to come to this uh, catalog and cocktails tomorrow, and you okay. can ask the question there. But I, I will say that some technical, some interesting, some challenges that people will want to go uh, see addressed is you want to have something like Data World be a third party independent broker, and you can like almost an escrow service, and you want to say, here's my company. I'm. I trust. I trust data.world to go, here's, they have access to my data. And then the vendors trust data.world to say, you got access to my data too. And data.world will go on and saying, here's the match. Look, the matches for this data is around 80%. This is there, and now you guys go negotiate your price. So I think having this type of match, and how do I do this match? Well, you gotta have, it. go into the technical aspects, right? We need to do a lot of entity linking, right? Because it's one of the big challenges. This is, this is a huge challenge right there, the entity linking. That's the only way we're gonna do this match. So I would I would argue that I think one of the the, the the technical challenges to really have good entity linking, and at some point it's con it's going to be manual, um, <laughs> defining these or have ways to go define these manual rules and then go see well I think there's an eighty percent match with a ninety percent confidence measure itself. So I think that's going to be something. I think that's a technical challenge you need to go address, and then with that information you can go price it. You you can figure out how to go price it. Well, um, so and in that sense, just a reminder that those people who want to learn more about and talk more about pricing and marketplaces, they can do that with cocktails um, tomorrow. Um, we will um, wrap up now this second uh, webinar in our series. Thank you so much, Juan, for giving us this fresh um, an ambitious perspective on um, where data portals and catalogs um, should be going to match make between the open and uh, the corporate uh, world. Um, and I hope you will join me again, uh, same time in, in two weeks for um, another um, interesting talk. Uh, we will make the recording of um, the webinar available. Um, and in two weeks, uh, we are going to welcome Dee, uh, Deidre Lee, um, who has been working, among other things, on the National Irish Open Government Data Portal and is going to tell us something about that journey. Thank you very much. And thank you, Juan, again, for being with us today and for everyone else for joining and for the questions. Goodbye. <laughs>